Thank you very much, uh, <clears throat> members of Congress, distinguished guests, Secretary Kissinger. It is a great pleasure um, as Librarian of Congress to welcome you here to the Coolidge Auditorium. The Library of Congress has a tradition, quite a long one, of linking the world's knowledge with America's political leadership, beginning with Congress's purchase in 1815 of Thomas Jefferson's own wide-ranging private library containing many books in foreign languages. A century later, the Congressional Research Service, a major research institution working exclusively for the Congress, was uh, the first thing of this kind uh, in history, was founded here in the library. <clears throat> Excuse me, still later during and just after World War II, key Library of Congress officials led the setting up of overseas information centers under both President Roosevelt and Secretary of State Dean Acheson. More recently, Congress established within the library the Open World Program, which has brought to America 11,000 emerging new leaders from the states of the former Soviet Union. And last year, the library launched a World Digital Library, which is adding multilingual, multinational content to our free online library, which now fields about 5 billion transactions a year worldwide. The library at the moment is supporting 30 scholarly researchers from all over the world who are in residence in this building and housed in our John W. Kluge Center. Václav Havel, the former president of the Czech Republic, is one of these scholars in residence, and he conducted just today separate discussions in this building with senators in the morning and members of the House of Representatives in the afternoon. The establishment of the Henry Alfred Kissinger Endowment has provided a kind of pinnacle for this library as a national institution with an international reach here on Capitol Hill. The endowment was set up by Dr. Kissinger's many friends. It funds a Kissinger chair for a senior scholar, currently uh, Dr. Charles Subchan, and it makes possible a unique annual event here on Capitol Hill, the Kissinger Lecture on Foreign Policy and International Relations, which is being given for the fifth time tonight. It's appropriate, I think, to have a Kissinger endowment at the Library of Congress because, as is well known, Dr. Kissinger is a scholar as well as a statesman. The library not only is glad to have his papers in our manuscript division, but also to have 77 Kissinger titles in our main catalog. I am happy that Henry and Nancy Kissinger are here with us tonight, and I might just ask them if they wouldn't mind just standing up and taking a bow. It is a personal as well as an institutional privilege to introduce tonight's Kissinger lecturer, James Addison Baker III. He was a supportive trustee and wise counselor when I first came to Washington as director of the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars. He has held many important public positions, and for more than a decade, an historic time that saw the end of the Cold War, he held successively three of the most important positions in the United States government, Chief of Staff to the President, Secretary of the Treasury, and Secretary of State. He has served the nation in the military and with a number of special assignments, most recently, of course, as co-chairman of the Iraq Study Group. He has agreed to answer questions after his lecture, so if you wish to ask one, please um, raise your hand, and an usher will give you a pencil and paper, and they will be mediated after the lecture by Dr. Deanna Markham, our Associate Library for Library Services. In addition to everything else, our speaker tonight has also had private sector career as a lawyer, has also been a businessman and an author. In his most recent book, 2006, Work Hard, Study, and Keep Out of Politics, that's the title, <clears throat> he wrote that, and I'm quoting him, each of us has the capacity to make the world a better place. All that it takes is the dedication of some part of our time and talent to public service. Ladies and gentlemen, it's an honor and pleasure to present a man who has exemplified in our time that dedication and that service. Please welcome James Baker. Hi, John. How are you? 
Thank you very much. <laughs> Senator. Jack. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Jim Billington, for that very generous introduction. But most of all, thank you, Jim, for your very effective and your dedicated service to our nation. Uh, distinguished members of Congress, members of the administration, ladies and gentlemen, it is a real privilege and an honor for me to be asked to deliver this lecture, named in honor of America's foremost practitioner of the art of statecraft. Henry Kissinger, uh, as most all in this audience know, is an American icon. In fact, many people believe that he should have been president, but of course, that was constitutionally impossible due to the circumstances of his birth on the planet Krypton. <laughs> <laughs> Joking aside, Henry and I have been good friends for a long time, and I greatly admire him. As a matter of fact, I sought his counsel before taking office of Secretary of State in 1989, and when I did so, he gave me some very good advice. We come from very different backgrounds, but we are both realists. We are practitioners of something called real politic, and we generally see eye to eye on foreign policy issues, particularly those that demand national sacrifice. Values are extraordinarily important in the formulation and implementation of America's foreign policy. But we each realize, I think, that the American public will not long support a policy that cannot be explained in terms of a hard national interest. Henry and I have one other thing in common, and that is that we both serve one of the nation's great presidents, Gerald Ford. Today, when I look around, you, when you see blue state, red state partisan fighting eroding America's confidence in their government, I think our leaders would do well to follow the model set by President Ford. Assuming office at a time when the nation was crippled by domestic division, he began the important process of healing those wounds and restoring America's pride in itself and in the institution of the presidency. Gerald Ford, I think, embodied the very best of the American spirit. He was honest, he was plain spoken, he was unpretentious, and he was driven by a desire to make his country the very best that it could be. And I know that Henry would agree with me that we were fortunate indeed to have worked for such a wonderful person and such a beloved president. Now, I've been asked to speak tonight uh, a bit about the global challenges that will test American foreign policy during the coming years. And I want to begin with three simple but I think very important propositions. First, one of the most significant phenomenon shaping world affairs today is the uniquely preeminent position of the United States in those affairs. Second, I think how best to use that power in ways that advance both our interests and our values is the fundamental challenge that confronts U.S. policymakers. And third, even as we forge a policy to promote those goals, we must beware, I think, of strategic overreach. So let me take these propositions one by one. First of all, by any standard you want to use to measure, the United States today enjoys a unique preeminence in world affairs. However, as I will stress later, our might is not limitless. But compared to earlier great powers, ancient Rome, Napoleonic France, and Britain at her peak just prior to World War I, we possess extraordinary and immense advantages over potential rivals. Our power is perhaps most obvious, I suppose, in the military arena. The defeat of the Taliban, the overthrow of Saddam Hussein, clearly demonstrated, I think, our unparalleled ability to project decisive force across vast distances, across oceans, and across continents. Our services represent the best armed 
and the best trained and the best led military in the world. No other countries even begin to approach this capability, and in my opinion, they will not for decades to come. We are also, of course, an economic powerhouse. Our output represents almost a quarter of world GDP. Moreover, our performance over the last two decades economically has significantly outpaced that of our traditional competitors such as Japan and the countries of Western Europe. And despite the scandals that rocked American, corporate America earlier in this decade, we remain at the forefront of economic efficiency, innovation, and entrepreneurship. In addition, we wield immense diplomatic influence in the global arena. The United States enjoys strong and durable bilateral relationships with a host of friendly countries, maybe not as strong as they once were, but becoming strong again. And we also play a leadership role in international organizations such as the United Nations, the IMF, NATO, and the WTO. And last but not least, perhaps most importantly, we represent an ideology, the ideology of free market democracy that is without a serious global rival. Now that model is clearly not triumphant everywhere, but the trend over recent decades, I think, has been unmistakably in the direction of democracy and free markets. Our old international adversary, communism, of course, has been swept into the dustbin of history, and no other ideology has risen to take its place. It is true that radical Islamic fundamentalism is a potent force and perhaps becoming more potent. But by definition, its appeal is limited to countries with significant Muslim populations. In short, there is today no country, or I would submit to you no group of countries, that can challenge our international preeminence. Now that may change, probably will, as countries like China and India loom larger on the world stage. But for now, and for the foreseeable future, I think, the United States is the only true global power. Now my second proposition. How can we best use this unparalleled power? I realize that this is a question that is much easier to ask than it is to answer. But how well we answer it will surely determine if our current preeminence continues for years, for decades, or for even longer. So I would like to offer a few ideas, 10 maxims, if you will, that I think will help us find our way in the international arena and that will help us find the answer to that question. First, I think we must be comfortable with using our power. In a real sense, we have no alternative because if the United States does not exercise power, others will. We simply have too much at stake in the world to walk away from it, even if we could. This was true before September 11, 2001, but it is even, I think, truer today as we combat the scourges of international terrorism and the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. We should also remember that the United States has proven itself to be, on balance, a powerful force for good in world affairs. Does this mean that we are perfect? Of course not. But in the major global conflicts of the last century, you take World War I, World War II, the Cold War, the United States played a historic role in defeating imperialism and totalitarianism. Other countries depend upon our leadership. This is most obviously true of our allies in Western Europe and East Asia and elsewhere. But even countries that are sometimes anything but friendly often seek our engagement. Second, we need to recognize that even U.S. power is limited. We cannot be, even if we wanted to be, the policeman for the world, and we don't want to be. And we should not be expected to be by those countries that would like us to be in today's unipolar world. 
As powerful as we are, we simply cannot solve every problem in the world. Iraq, for instance, has shown a limit of our military strength. In saying this, I yield to no one in my admiration for the magnificent performance of our men and women in uniform. But I think it is plain that our military services, which crushed the conventional Iraqi army within weeks in 2003, face altogether more intractable foes in insurgent groups and sectarian militias. Their task, I might add, is extraordinarily complicated by divisions within the Iraqi government and growing frustration among many Iraqis at the lack of basic security and services. Our power is limited in other areas as well. As strong as this economy of ours is, we still need the cooperation of others in areas such as expanding trade and investment and coordinating macroeconomic policy. The same is true in the diplomatic arena, where our influence can be constrained when we are unable to persuade others. Securing the support of China and Russia, for instance, is going to be critical in crafting a tough response to Iran's nuclear programs. Not least, the exercise of American power is limited by the ability of our leaders to generate and sustain domestic political support. This is a subject to which I will turn in just a moment. Third, we should be prepared to act unilaterally when the situation requires it. Unilateral action, after all, remains the surest and best test of a great power. But we should never undertake unilateral action lightly. For reasons that I will discuss, it is almost always preferable to act in concert with others. But when our vital interests are at stake, we must be prepared, if necessary, to go it alone. Fourth, but we also need to appreciate the importance of allies. It is no coincidence that the gr three great global conflicts of the 20th century, World War I, World War II, and the Cold War, were won, after all, by coalitions. By securing allies, our policymakers can achieve important goals. Most obviously, partners allow us to spread the human and financial costs of any action. We can create what could be called an efficient division of international labor. In the Gulf War of 1990 to 91, for instance, a military coalition consisting of the United States, Britain, France, even many Arab nations and others, was bolstered by financial support from Gulf Arabs, from the Japanese, from the Germans, and from a number of other Western Europeans. Many forget that that Gulf War cost the United States hardly a nickel, because at our request, our allies provided this critical financial support. In addition, allies can help secure legitimacy for our actions. In the case of that first Gulf War, the United Nations Security Council's authorization of force promoted support for action against Saddam Hussein, not only in the international community, but just as importantly, right here at home. We were, after all, a Republican administration dealing with a Democratic Congress. Fifth, we need to use all of the means at our disposal. These tools include moral suasion, they include bilateral talks, and they include multilateral action. Such action can occur through formal institutions, as it did in 1991 in the United Nations Security Council. It can occur through NATO, as it did in the uh, disputes in the Balkans. It can occur in the financial uh, organizations, the IMF and the World Bank. But it can also be pursued through informal groups, like the coalition against Iraq in the first Gulf War. Effective foreign policy, I think, embodies a continuum of action, a continuum of action from private demarches to military intervention. In short, one size does not fit all when it comes to foreign policy. And I think this is especially true today, my friends, as we confront the threats posed by international terrorism 
and the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction. We require a comprehensive approach. Military action, such as the battle against the Taliban, has got to be a part of it. But it is evident that this cannot be the sole solution. A successful approach must include the coordination of intelligence gathering and law enforcement. It must also include international cooperation in such areas as money laundering, tighter border controls, and international pressure on rogue regimes. Sixth, we should be prepared to change course if that's necessary. And we are doing just that right now in our Iraq policy. Consistency, of course, is an important element of foreign policy. It permits us to move beyond crisis management, and it facilitates the development of long-term strategies. Consistency can also foster stability by reassuring allies and setting down clear markers for potential adversaries. But when events change, we must have the flexibility, we must be prepared to change with them. The rise of Mikhail Gorbachev in the Soviet Union, for instance, marked a dramatic shift in the worldview of Soviet leadership. And it was therefore only right that Washington reach out to Moscow in ways that were unimaginable just years before. Seventh, we need to recognize and we need to accept that the United States will sometimes have to deal with authoritarian regimes. In a perfect world, we could perhaps work only with other democracies, but unfortunately, we do not live in a perfect world. And there is no sign that it will become one anytime soon. To be very blunt, sometimes we have no choice but to work with governments that fall short when it comes to democratic practices and the protection of human rights. Easily the most striking example of this, I think, is our World War II alliance with Stalin's Soviet Union, one of the most murderous regimes in history. But given the immediate and deadly threat posed by Nazi Germany, we had no alternative. And during the Cold War, we made common cause with authoritarian regimes in Latin America, in Asia, and elsewhere. Today, our allies in the war on terror include countries in the Middle East and in Central Asia that bear scant resemblance to Jeffersonian democracies. Now, I won't pretend that this is a satisfying state of affairs, but there is simply no alternative to it. Eighth. I think we must be prepared to talk to our enemies. I don't say this because talking, per se, is a good thing, although I suppose there is something to be said for maintaining a bilateral dialogue, if only to avoid misunderstanding and missteps. No, the fundamental reason I think we should be prepared to speak to our enemies is, is that if we do it right, it is in our interest to do so. This is why we maintain an embassy in Moscow throughout the Cold War. And this is why even so staunch and anti-communist as President Reagan was prepared to negotiate with the Soviets. Talking to hostile states, whether it was Moscow during the Cold War or Pyongyang or Damascus today, is not appeasement. It was and it is good foreign policy. Ninth. We should be mindful that values are very, very important, but that they aren't the only thing. It is harsh to say it, but sadly, we cannot formulate or implement American foreign policy according to the principles of Mother Teresa. Because when the body bags start coming home, you cannot maintain domestic political support for the policy unless you have some overriding national interest. Promoting democracy and free markets is very rightly central to U.S. foreign policy, and it has been for a long time. A freer, more prosperous world is a better world for our own citizens and for people everywhere. But I think we have to remember that that progress towards democracy and free markets is neither inevitable nor is it without its own strains. The example of World War I, I think, is sobering. World War I followed immediately on the heels of a period of unparalleled economic integration.
that some have referred to as the first golden age of globalization. One of the most influential books of the pre-war period, Norman Angel's The Great Illusion, argued that general war had become impossible because of the economic advantages to peace. Yet we know what followed, one of the very bloodiest periods in human history. The lesson? I think the lesson is that we should be very wary when talk turns to inevitability. What man creates, man can destroy. Moreover, both democracy and free markets sometimes can be decidedly mixed blessings in the short run. Economic reforms can lead to strains that prompt populist backlashes, nor can elections by themselves be counted upon to produce stable or responsible regimes. The popular success of Hamas among Palestinians and Hezbollah in Lebanon, I think, are cases in point. So should we support free markets and democracy? Of course we should. As I said earlier, they have been rightly central to our foreign policy for a long time. But I think we have to be especially careful of underestimating the difficulties that countries can face as they embark on the path to democracy. And I think we should also remember that in foreign policy, stability is not a dirty word. Tenth and last, we must always remember that domestic support is vital to any successful foreign policy because the will of the American people, the will of the American people is the final arbiter of foreign policy in our democracy. Generating and sustaining domestic support for foreign policy is in every way just as important as the policy itself. Without that support, Specific policies risk repudiation at the polls or, even worse, public disenchantment with foreign engagement in general. And that brings me to one final proposition. I mentioned it earlier. I think we have to be careful to avoid strategic overextension. The history of empires and great powers from Rome onwards provides an important lesson. Power must be husbanded, and it must be husbanded carefully. It is precious, and it is finite. Spreading it too thinly can lead to disaster. Choices still matter. So do priorities. Now, let me make it clear. I am anything but a declinist when it comes to the United States, because I am absolutely convinced that our country's future is an extraordinarily bright one. But while the United States may be the most powerful state in history, we should never forget, as I said earlier, we are not omnipotent. Our society may be good, but it is not perfect. As the theologian Reinhold Niebuhr wrote, great nations are too strong to be destroyed by their foes, but they can easily be overcome by their own pride. Ladies and gentlemen, the approach I suggest here tonight does not fall easily into traditional categories of foreign policy, that is, either realism or idealism. It contains, I hope and believe, the best elements of both. And it embodies one of our most distinctive national characteristics, and that is that we Americans are a practical people, sometimes less interested in ideological purity than we are in solving problems. What I suggest, I think, could be called pragmatic idealism. While firmly grounded in values, it appreciates the complexity of the real world, which, after all, is a world of hard choices and painful trade-offs. This, though, is the real world in which we must live, in which we must decide, and in which we must act. It is a world that I would submit to you that Ronald Reagan understood and understood very well. He was, as you know, famously a man of deeply held conviction, but he was also pragmatic. When I was his chief of staff, he often told me, Jim, I'd rather get 80% I want of what I want than to go over the cliff with my flag flying. And I want to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, 
the Gipper was right. Such a balanced approach, I believe, can help us avoid both the cynicism of realism and the impracticality of idealism. It is based on an optimistic view of man, but it is tempered by our knowledge of human imperfection. It promises no easy answers. It promises no quick fixes. But such an approach does, I am convinced, offer our surest guide and our best hope for navigating our great country safely through this precarious period of unparalleled opportunity and risk in world affairs. Thank you all very, very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much, Secretary Baker. I thought since we have Secretary Kissinger here, we might just invite him to open up the question and answer period, which will then, after if he uh, uh, chooses to say a few remarks or raise a question, we will then turn over to uh, Dr. Markham, who will uh, field the questions which you have submitted from the audience. Uh, so with thanks again to Secretary Baker, I invite Secretary Kissinger. Let me simply say that I'm proud that uh, my name was given to this speech. I think it is an important speech. It is a wise speech. And it lays down maxims for American foreign policy with which I totally associate myself. The debate between realism and idealism can turn into escapism. Anybody who has made important decisions knows that they come up, when they come up, they are, seem 50-50 or 51-49. And without values, you cannot find your way through the complexities. But without an understanding of the objective context, you run the risk of overextension and overtaxing your society. The art of statesmanship is to operate at the limit of what can be sustained for a long period of time, because history is longer than any one administration. The contribution of Jim Baker to our society has been that he has always inspired us or led us to operate at the limits of the possible while knowing what the possible is. We have heard a, an expression of this tonight, and I want to thank you, Jim, for having taken this evening, and above all, the care that has gone into this important statement of maxims of American foreign policy, which we should all take to heart. Thank you, Jim. Are you now ready for questions, Mr. Baker? 
Well said. Uh, there were so many questions from the audience, and we're trying very hard to sort through them, and I'm afraid there are many more than Mr. Baker can answer, but let me begin with a few, and we'll see if we can work in a few more. Uh, first question. What is the best way of countering the perception that our effort in the Middle East is a war between religions? Well, you know, uh, I think the president, uh, when he first uh, uh, entered the fray in Iraq, made it very clear and has, and has done so since then that our quarrel is not with, uh, with Islam and not with Muslims in general. It's with radical Islamic fundamentalists who resort to uh, terror, that is, uh, injuring or killing innocent civilians in order to achieve a political aim. And I think that the best way to, uh, to get that message out there is for our policymakers to keep saying that. And I think they I have no reason to think they won't, because I think that is the policy of the United States. I see the new Deputy Secretary of State, uh, John Negroponte, sitting here in the front row, and he'll get that message out if nobody else will. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the next question. Not too long ago, your maxims would have been non-controversial, but now they are the subject of genuine debate. Why? Is this the result of 9-11, or has there been a deeper change in America's foreign policy culture? If so, how would you characterize the change? No, I don't, I, I would not uh, say that there's been a deeper change, although I will say that, that um, it's possible that we, that we have slipped a, few of, a couple of these maxims along the way. I mentioned in my remarks that, um, that America has uh, strong bilateral relationships uh, around the world. Uh, some of those we all know were frayed as a consequence of our uh, undertaking in Iraq, but both the President and Secretary of State and other members of the administration are doing uh, uh, extraordinarily good work, in my opinion, in repairing the damage that was done to those bilateral relationships, and they're making a, a concerted and aggressive effort to do so, and having, uh, I think, a, a fair degree of success. So I don't think that it was a fundamental uh, change. I've, I've believed for a long time, uh, as I mentioned to you, and, and, and as I mentioned in the remarks, I worked at the right hand of Ronald Reagan for four years. Everybody thought that somehow uh, President Reagan was an ideologue who would not pay any attention to, uh, to uh, possibilities, um, and, and that simply was not true. He was, he was quite pragmatic in his approach. I've been pragmatic in, in my entire uh, period of public service, whether it was uh, as Chief of Staff of the White House, Treasury Secretary, or Secretary of State, because I think that, uh, as I mentioned again in the remarks, the American people are practical people, and they understand and know that the, the important thing is to get things done for the country that benefit the country. Thank you. What are your thoughts on the January 2007 Wall Street Journal op-ed piece by this lecture's namesake, Mr. Kissinger, along with Sam Nunn, William Perry, and George Schultz? Do you agree with the authors that a world free of nuclear weapons is a legitimate policy goal consistent with America's moral heritage? Yes. <laughs> I do. Yes, I do. And, uh, and I don't know whether you remember it or not, but the, the guy that went to a summit during the... Co I was the last Cold War Secretary of State. Uh, the president who went to a summit with the Soviet Union and made a proposal to get rid of all nuclear weapons was a president named Ronald Reagan, uh, for whom I was working, for whom I worked for eight years. So the answer is absolutely, if we can get there. But getting there is, how you get there, of course, is the issue. As I said, how do we use our power? That's the issue. It's easier said than done. Thank you. To re-earn the friendship and fidelity of our former strong allies, Western Europe, Canada, and others, what, in your opinion, must the U.S. be prepared to give? What do you believe would be the best way to strengthen the strong ties of the 1990s? Well, as I said earlier, I think we're doing that. Uh, I think we, we recognize that we, we lost some, uh, some stroke with our historic allies 
uh, in, the, in the lead up to and in the initial phases or maybe even some of the follow-up phases of the Iraq war. And we've been uh, moving to, to repair that damage, and I think we're doing, uh, doing quite a good job. Let me, let me say this, though, about what happened. Uh, we went, the President went to the United Nations for uh, a Security Council resolution authorizing the use of force against uh, Iraq. He got a 15 to nothing vote that said that if Iraq didn't do certain things uh, by way of, of coming clean with respect to what the intelligence said were weapons of mass destruction, there would be serious consequences. Uh, our our long-term ally, uh, uh, Great Britain, under the leadership of Tony Blair, came to us and said, look, we need a separate, we need a second resolution that spells out what serious consequences mean. And in an effort to accommodate them, the president went for a second resolution. We didn't have the votes to get it. Uh, and one of our longtime allies, uh, even before, even before the, the uh, issue almost was put on the table, announced that it was going to veto anything we put on the table. Now, I've had a lot of experience with the UN. I'm the guy that was Secretary of State when we got the Security Council to authorize the use of force against a member state in the first time in history. But I've never in my life seen a situation where a PERM-5 member country, most of all an ally of the United States, would stand up and announce in advance that regardless of what you and the United Kingdom put on the table, we're going to veto it. So this is a two-way street. It's not up to the United States totally to, to uh, improve the relationships and repair the damage, if you will. It's a two-way street, and we must, see, uh, we must see action by our allies as well. We are seeing that now. We are seeing that in the, in the context of Iraq. We are seeing very good cooperation from uh, historic allies with whom we had a falling out, uh, particularly in the war against terror and particularly in uh, some of the intelligence, uh, and John knows this, the intelligence and the financial transaction uh, issues that we're dealing with with our allies. So that, that damage is going to be repaired. I said in my remarks, these countries want to see the U.S. engaged and involved uh, internationally, because when we are on balance, we have been a force for good and a force for stability. And we fought four wars, or three wars, I'm sorry, in the last uh, century, uh, two, two hot ones and a cold one, uh, in, in Europe and for Europe, and we never asked for anything, as uh, Secretary Powell said, we never asked for more than enough ground to bury our dead. So people know that when we get involved, we're not looking to get into their sandbox, we're not looking to take anything through uh, self-aggrandizing uh, intention, and uh, I think we're those. I think those alliances are going to are going to be revitalized. We have we have uh, allies now helping us in uh, in uh, Afghanistan, and the efforts against a resurgent Taliban there. Thank you. Um, the next questioner asks. The Israeli-Palestinian problem is the biggest problem in the Middle East. What do you recommend we do? It's in the Iraq Study Group report. Uh, in detail, I would refer, it's only, <laughs> A, it's only $13, and B, it's only 50 pages, so you can read it. <laughs> what I recommend we do is, is what we laid out there, chapter and verse, and that is to get, get very aggressive about trying to, to, uh, to uh, help our, our strong, longtime ally Israel achieve peace with their Arab neighbors, because the Israeli body politic, quite frankly, is tired of being a nation perpetually at war. The only really secure borders Israel has are the borders she negotiated peace with, with Jordan and Egypt. I think, I think that if we were able to produce, and the Secretary of State has just come back from the region trying to do that very thing, I think that's the kind of thing we need to do. But I also happen to be one who thinks we should be talking uh, a great deal more to Syria than we are talking to them, because when you talk about Arab-Israeli peace, you really need to be talking about a comprehensive peace. It cannot just be uh, Israeli-Palestinian. Why talk to Syria? Okay, I'll tell you why it'd be a good thing to do. Because the Hamas, which is, uh, is the now a major uh, factor in the government of the, Palestinian, of the Palestinians, 
uh, does not recognize Israel's right to exist. Hamas's offices are in Damascus. Syria has great influence with Hamas. In my opinion, if we could bring Syria back to where she was in the late 90s or early 2000s, uh, we could get Hamas to, they might be able to get Hamas to recognize Israel's right to exist. Syria is also the transit point for weapons uh, going into, for weapons to Hezbollah. Uh, if we could cut that off, that would be a significant uh, thing to do for Israel and in Israel's favor. But getting Hamas to recognize Israel's right to exist would then give Israel a negotiating partner with the Palestinians. Uh, right now, they don't, we, we, don't, we don't have that. There are many other reasons. Now, to do that, I'm not suggesting, as I said in my remarks, talking is not a strategy. I'm not suggesting you just talk. Syria would have to agree to stop screwing around in Lebanon. She would have to agree to uh, cooperate fully with the investigations on the assassinations of Hariri and Gamal, cut off arms shipments to Hezbollah, and do everything she could to get Hamas to recognize Israel's right to exist. So I, I'm, a big, I'm a big supporter of the idea of talking to Syria. Now, it might not work. But if it doesn't work, what have you lost? If you don't give anything, and you won't give, don't give anything in advance. And I will find, close by saying that, that I made 15 trips to Syria when Syria was a, a list on, on, the, on our terrorist list. That is, list of countries that sponsored, were state sponsors of terrorism. 15 trips I made in the aftermath of the first Gulf War, and on the 16th trip, Syria changed 25 years of policy and came to the table to sit face to face to negotiate peace with Israel, something she'd been unwilling to do for 25 years. So it's, in my view, it's worth the, the risk anyway. I don't know what you risk if you do it the right way. How would you define the war on terror and how does this definition suggest the United States will be able to conclude the war on terror? Well, I, I think that the, the war on terror is an extraordinary, I mentioned in, the, uh, in my remarks, uh, that and the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction are two of the most difficult issues facing our policymakers today and will be two of the most difficult issues facing them in the years to come, in my opinion. The war on terror is a transnational issue of great significance to us. All you got to do is think back to uh, September, 2000, September 11, 2001. Uh, there are people out there, and it's, again, it's not Muslims in general. It's not the, Islam, the religion of Islam. It's radical Islamic fundamentalists who want to use terror to achieve uh, political ends. Any time you, you seek to kill or maim innocent civilians in order to achieve a political result, that is terror. And, uh, and Israel is, is subject to it just as today we and other nations in the West are. It is a fight that we must continue to wage full bore. Uh, but one, of the, one, of the, one good way to do that, in my opinion, is to is to see if you can't convert some of your enemies. Maybe not make them friends, but you might be able to get them to stop uh, some of the support that they, that they give to the uh, terrorist effort. Thank you. And I think this should be the last question, unfortunately, but uh, there are so many that people would like to ask. As China's and other nations' oil needs grow, the likelihood of struggle arises. How should we think about long-term crucial resource needs? Well, there are a lot of people who have been writing about our dependence upon foreign oil and how we need to find a way to, uh, to overcome that or move away from that uh, dependence, uh, renewable energy and, and uh, such things as that. Uh, and I think that uh, in, in the long term, that's really what we're, what we're probably going to have to do. Uh, there have been, every day you pick up the newspaper today, you see more and more uh, efforts in that direction. Uh, it's important to us from a geostrategic standpoint. It's also important to us from an economic standpoint. Uh, beyond that, I don't know 
I, I wouldn't. I, I have nothing to add to that except we do need to figure out how we can minimize our dependence on foreign oil. Thank you very much. You've been very generous in answering questions. To all of you, I couldn't get to. I apologize. Uh, but thank you very much for those answers. I now ask Dr. Billington to return to the microphone to conclude the evening. Thank you very much. I need hardly say it, but once again, thank you for a lifetime of service and for a very memorable evening. Mr. Secretary, we're all in your debt. Wish you well, and thank you. He also is, commands an institute for serious study of public policy in Houston, Texas, and you certainly shared a great deal of wisdom with us tonight. Once again, on behalf of everyone here, I think the applause speaks for itself, but it's worth one more round. Thank you. <laughs>